Okay, we're back. This is Getting the Record Straight. I'm Rob Bell, talking with Lamar Manson, a.k.a. Black Ice. Um, I was just saying that, uh, you know, oftentimes I feel we don't, uh, uh, as a city, um, promote, you know, the genius and the uh, brilliance of our artists here and um, uh, and oftentimes uh, uh, it seems like people who are from here get more notice and more recognition elsewhere uh, mm. than they do uh, here in their own hometown. I forget what your mom would know, but I can't remember the biblical reference about a prophet. Uh, yeah, no, I, I was I was actually getting ready to reference that that same quote. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a, a prophet is never, you know, something like a prophet yeah. is never beloved in his homeland or something, well, like that. Yeah. something like that right you know so uh, but i think that's the outside of really uh outside of places like uh atlanta you know atlanta uh yeah yeah well no 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 i can't say that but i think i think it's i think it goes kind of everywhere you know but you know places like atlanta have really supported their local artists um uh places like houston maybe miami mm -hmm. but but other places really you know uh other cities chicago detroit new york uh philly dc all, all these places are kind of the same when you talk to other artists they say well yeah i couldn't really <laughs> new york may be a little different because all of the labels were there you know but even still you'll have artists who say, you know, Yasin Bey and, and Talib talk about it all the time where, you know, they feel like they had to light themselves on fire in New York in order to, you know what I'm saying, you know, to get an applause. You know, meanwhile, uh, the Roots, you know, Reek and them used to do Black Lily at the Wetlands, Thank at the God. Wetlands, and, and it, was, it was packed to the helm, you know what I mean? But obviously the Roots are a different kind of beast. They've had a, 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 a cult following since 1989 you know what i'm saying you know so and but so philly is but philly has always been that kind of uh uh uh, uh bernard hopkins you know uh kind of town man we like you know we where yeah if you gonna step up to the plate you really got to step up to the plate so uh uh but it also in the 90s you know 90s early 2000s listen you couldn't you couldn't speak about soul music without without having philly in the conversation you know so try uh, try going back to the 60s i mean, I mean of course i mean we can go you can go, go and, back you know, with how philly and, the and the philly international and you know you ever been champagne king and uh you know sister sledge and you know we've always we've always had a foot in soul you know what i'm saying in, in the soul scene uh, in and the jazz. 90s, Our jazz. You know, of course. I mean, of course. I mean, you know, jazz, we are just as, we have been, we have turned out just as phenomenal, we have turned out just as many phenomenal uh, uh, jazz players as any other well, you know, well known jazz town. Yeah, we're right so, there, man. I was, uh, I'm so glad you said Black Lily because I was trying desperately to get, recall that. Because I used to go down there when it was at uh, the five spot. At the five spot. Yeah, yeah. It was only. It was only. It was. It was only at the five spot. Yeah. You know, here in Philly. Well, well but, yeah. Right. Before, before, before Black Lily. Before Black Lily, you had uh, the Freebop movement. Jafar Barron and and Jeffrey and you know and Jeff Bradshaw mm -hmm. at Silk City on Monday nights. You know what I'm saying? Okay. With with Questlove and Rich, you know, Rich Medina and all them spinning where they seamlessly wove the live band with the DJ and you never stopped dancing, but you never knew when it was a live performance or the DJ spinning because it was such a seamless thing. So we've always, and, and the thing about Philly is we've always supported each other in the sense that in the 90s, late 90s, early 2000s, we all kind of ran with each other. You know, the poets, there was no poetry scene here that was kind of that was separate from the soul scene. Right. We all ran with the MCs, ran with the singers, ran with the poets, ran with the musicians. We all was at Wilhelmina's. We were all was at uh, New Market Cafe with uh, uh with Blue Funk. We was all at Silk City. We was all at the Five Spot. So it, it was a very universal 
thing, especially in, in so I, I never really, I never really like uh, peeped a poetry scene until I got out of Philly. Oh, okay. Because then I was kind of like, you know, New Yorkian and things like this, where it was like, oh, wait a minute. Because matter of fact, in Philly, we didn't even do poetry acapella. You know, I know that they did that in October Gallery, but I never did October Gallery. It happened on Friday night. I was a barber. I had to get my money, you know. So I never, I never, I never made it to October Gallery, you know. But I did the other, the, you know, the other spots. Mm-hmm. And then I started hosting Blue Phone. And like I said, we always did poetry to, to music. You know, so we, we didn't even know what it was. Like, when we went up, I went up to New York, and I was like, I know, there's no DJ playing, no great beats, there's no band, there's no, because we had to, as poets, we had to, we had to jump in the, into the, we had to jump into the, to, into the shed the same way vocalists did, where we had to vibe it, we had to feel the vibe, and then a lot of things in Philly didn't even have hosts. You just had to be there and feel the vibe. And when it was your time, when you felt the vibe, you kind of just naturally got up there. And if you was dope, you did your thing, you know, and uh, poet, singer, MC, or and or otherwise. So, yeah, you know, Philly was a. It's like I said. It's, it's a, the the way I can describe it best is just you know Bernard Hopkins, man. Like it's a hard, it's a hard town to you know. They say you know if you make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. New York was easy to me. Philly. What? what? annoys me uh, getting back to what I was you know trying to get at was we don't know I mean not we but folks don't know I mean you know how hard it is for Bernard Hopkins and uh Matthew Saad Muhammad that might be before your time great fight these great fighters but we got a statue to Rocky you know and that's what just right Meldrick you know we had Meldrick Taylor you say you know you know, we had Mel, we had Meldrick, we had Meldrick, we got Bernard, you know, Bernard Hopkins. We had plenty of great fighters. But like you said, we our, our greatest, I mean, our greatest sports icon that comes out of Philly, ironically, is a fictitious character. Even though we've had, you know, Julius Irvin, Moses Malone, you know. Joe uh, Frazier, you know. Right, you, right, so, you know, Joe Frazier, you know, these, these kinds of, we got Joe Frazier, but there's a statue of Rocky. <laughs> you know that over that so but that's but that's philly you know for some reason unfortunately yeah, yeah i didn't you know as as and it's also one of those things too maybe it's the era but i also really think that had i not moved to new york you know i would have still been known to known as who i am but i don't know if i would have met russell mm-hmm. you know so there's also there's, there's also the thing about opportunity and what opportunity lies in Philly. And a lot of times you can, you can be a Philadelphia journeyman, but that's all you'll be, yeah. you know, until you, you have to stretch out and go somewhere else where there's more plug. And then you can, you know, and then Philly will, like I was scared coming back to Philly for the first couple of times performing, you know, because even with deaf poetry, I, I was scared s- stiff to come to walk out on that stage because I really felt like my city wasn't going to embrace the you know the success that had come my way and but when i stepped out on stage and they went crazy it was like oh i'm home you know saying you know like and that that but but it was that thing where it really let me know like oh okay i'm a philly artist that has that has put a stamp on it you know let me pose two questions to you and, and maybe you can segue from one to the other. I was listening to a piece you did called um, Lone Soldier mm-hmm. and you know, just blew me away. Uh, but it hit me, it touched me, you know, because you know, family means so much to me. It, it's, it's so significant to us as a people. Uh, you know, and I wanted you to talk a little bit about that particular cut. I mean, that just, like I said, cut me deep. Mm-hmm. And then, um, and then I wanted to uh, want you to segue, if you can, into where you are right now, because you're you're talking from Europe, right? Where are you now? Is this, is yeah, I'm in Amsterdam. Pardon me. I'm in Amsterdam. In Amsterdam. Yeah. And talk a little bit about the kind of, um, you know, reception and universality of the of our art and your art in particular. And so if you could start with the family thing and then maybe get there 
We got about four minutes left, four or five minutes. Okay, so I mean, okay, so real, real quick, Lone Soldier was written uh, with my oldest daughter, who's 25 now, with her own two children. Um, she was about she was about five or six, mm. and uh, uh, her mom and I were, you know, we were going through that young parent, young parental, egoistic, uh, uh, immature, you know, thing, you know, where I, I I was I was at fault, she was at fault, they were. You know, it was that kind of thing. So at, at the time when I wrote it, you know, w what I did know was that a lot of times, you know, um, we always hear the stories, uh, you know, the side of the mother and what they have to go through being a single parent, which is absolutely true, but we never, die. no no one ever really delves into, and even men don't necessarily talk about it, you know, amongst ourselves, uh, what what fathers go through, you know, not, not being able to, uh, touch their children every day, not being able to be a, 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 a everyday dad, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, having those kinds of, um, having those uh, responsibilities and privileges uh, relegated to weekend visits, every other weekend visits, no visits at all, you know, supervised visits, animosity, court, you know, mm -hmm. having it boiled down to a, 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 you know, a child support check, you mm -hmm. know, these kinds of things. Yeah. Uh, so I wrote it kind of in defense of fathers. Now, I probably wrote it one day in the barbershop. Man, we got into a conversation, you know, because people do kind of get into it. And then, uh, you know, and it came to me. And I wrote it in defense of fathers uh, who care about their children, who cared about their family uh, unit. But for some odd reason, in whatever life happenings, uh, they, uh, you know, that it, 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 it derailed. Uh, and, but then when I started doing it, when I started reciting it and performing it, uh, a lot of women would come up to me mm. and, and, and thank me because they feel like either that's what their children's father was trying to, you know, was trying to say to them. They, a light clicked on in their head and said, wow, you know, I, didn't, I never looked at it in that way. A lot of daughters said that, you know what, I think this is what my, you know, so it, it, it came out to be quite vindicating. And, and, and more universal than, than I intended when I originally wrote it. I intended it for it to really be for men. And, uh, and my pop called himself the Lone Soldier. So, mm. you know, uh, and uh, so, yeah, so fast forward, I'm here in Amsterdam. And uh, 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 I'm, uh, since moving here, I've been here five years. Mm. Uh, I moved here for love. Um, uh, that love has has turned into two new beautiful children uh, and, uh, and a family here. And I'm uh, probably the best dad I've ever been. Mm -hmm. you know, not even probably, you know, <laughs> the best dad I've ever been. Uh, just because at, at 48 years old, you see fathering a little different. You know, uh, the things that I know... I didn't know at 23 and 25 when I had uh, my, my two oldest children, you know, I, I didn't, I wasn't as wise at 30, you know, at 30 and thir at 30 something when I had my, you know, when, when Leilani was born now, uh, I'm just a lot wiser. Uh, so I, I, um, I see things, I, I observe things, I learn a lot more, you know, like I, I, I learn from my kids, I, I kind of really, uh, let them lead me in, in a lot of times. So, and that's what, you know, and I'm here and the art is continuing. I do more educated, you know, I've discovered this love of, well, actually through my lady, uh, you know, um, uh, I've discovered a love of educating, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm, I, dare I say I'm a, I'm just as dope of an educator as I am a performer, you know, um, if not doper. <laughs> it, 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 it has, uh, it has the, uh, it, it gives the same kind of satisfaction. Um, maybe, maybe a little bit more because to crack a young mind or, or, or even an older mind open to themselves. Um, Lamar, I got to stop you there. We got to stop. Running a little okay. over, man. We're yeah. going to have to do this again because we. Whenever you're ready. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, you know, you. Go so on. You know, I, I don't know. My mom must not have told you. you know what I'm saying, fifteen minute, fifteen minute segments. I don't know. You, we, we, we got. You know, I'm juicy. We gotta do more, man. <laughs> I'm, got, I'm still getting the hang of this, but thanks so much. Uh, I'm gonna oh, yeah, stop no recording problem. now.